Well, Dr. Marita Gilbert joins me on this episode of MSU Today. Dr. Gilbert is the Associate Dean of Diversity and Campus Inclusion for Michigan State University's renowned College of Osteopathic Medicine. Primarily, Marita and I are going to talk about the 24th annual Dr. William G. Anderson Slavery to Freedom Lecture Series, which is, if not the, it's one of the signature MSU celebrations of Black History Month. And uh, Dr. Gilbert, welcome to the program. So thank you so much for having me. I'm elated to be with with you this afternoon and to really just talk about this, our 24th. Can you believe that? Our 24th. Amazing. Slavery to Freedom Series. And the series does give the community opportunities to interact with multicultural leaders from education, business, industry, entertainment, and government. And for 24 years, this series has featured living icons of the American civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to talk about that lineup in a minute. Before we do that, Marita, a little bit of your background and how you eventually came back to work here at your alma mater. Yes, yeah, so thanks uh, for that question. I uh, currently am the Associate Dean for Diversity and Campus Inclusion at the College of Osteopathic Medicine. Um, I am an alumna. I got my PhD in kinesiology. And um, so kinesiology and osteopathic medicine, I, I'd like to think of us as kind of cousins. So there were, um, <laughs> uh, as I was an instructor, there are a lot of our students who um, were interested in becoming um, DOs. And so we had them at the undergraduate level. Um, and so I got to know some folks in osteopathic medicine while I was a doctoral student. I would say in terms of my work around inclusive excellence, I always kind of think of it as my life's work. Um, And some people look at me and are like, how could it be your life's work? You're kind of young. Well, I started um, as a teenager. Um, So if you remember on the series two years ago, we had um, Latasha Brown from Black Voters Matter. And I talked about the fact that we met when I was a teenager, I think I was like 13 or 14. And I was a member of 21st Century Leadership Camp in um, Alabama. And at that time, before they had a site, we moved um, every year and we were hosted by a historically black college. But we got to meet um, civil rights icons. um, And I mean, everyone from lawyers from the NAACP Legal Defense Fund to um, Bernice Johnson Reagan, right, who um, is a scholar in her own right, but, you know, was really what part of the, the singing, right, and the actual moving people from place to place. We learned about um, our history, right? Um, and all of this was because I had been introduced to a man named... Jerome Smith, and uh, we call him affectionately Big Duck. <laughs> and so um, in the Treme, the historic Treme neighborhood in New Orleans, um, he has the tambourine and fan um, camp every summer for um, young people. And that was really my introduction to people like Fannie Lou Hamer, because he had known her and, and so loved her and cherished her as um, someone who had been a grassroots movement um, person. He himself had been one of the Freedom Riders. And so um, that early exposure, I think, number one, um, grounded me in a sense of kind of knowing who I was um, and from a perspective of being really proud um, of African-American history and culture. But also... Um, it helped me to see that our history was living and organic. Um, and it wasn't just something stored in a book somewhere or something we saw, you know, every February on TV. Like I really could touch some of those history makers and trailblazers. Um, and it just made this impression on me about like how important it is um, to really know our own narratives and I think how important it is to to share them and then to be able to um, have access um, to folks who are making that history and to be able to ask questions for myself. And so um, from Big Duck to uh, 21st Century, where I met Latasha Brown and Tarana Burke at a very young age, 
um, to then kind of keeping that and understanding that I was a part of a lineage and a legacy and feeling a right and a responsibility kind of to carry that forward. And so um, throughout my life, even as I became a professor and then later an administrator and an executive leadership, um, that's that's never been lost on me. And it's kind of, um, it's so deep within into the core of me um, that it is always married to the rest of the work that I'm doing. So um, as we think about things like admissions and enrollment, I'm always thinking about um, historical context, right? So who has been historically excluded or left behind? What I should be thinking about or doing about that? Um, if we think about things like um, the history of our profession, right? History that is living, um, that we are between four or 5% of all of the doctors in the U.S., only four or five percent um, would identify as black. And that has not moved for an entire generation, right? These are things that I'm constantly thinking about. And not just that, that those are realities, but what is my role, right? What is my role to increase not just access, but um, helping um little boys and little girls, I may not even know them, right? But helping them, A, be able to see themselves as scientists and B, helping them have connections to aspirational kind of models. And then C, doing the work to make sure that we're tearing down those those barriers that are keeping them excluded. So um, I think that's kind of a, a broad uh, what, summary, but I, a good place to kind of start. What a thoughtful start. answer. That was really neat. Um, so again, you probably could go do this life's work of yours anywhere. Why was the College of Osteopathic Medicine at MSU the place for you to, to continue this important work? So one of the, the tenets of osteopathic medicine that is important to me is this whole idea of interconnectedness. And um, as a doctoral student, I used to attend the Slave Reader Freedom Series. And so when I came to interview for this role and found out um, that the series would be a part of my work. First of all, I couldn't believe it, <laughs> right? But I also saw it as such an opportunity, right? Because the way that I think about inclusive excellence, um, this gave me the opportunity to kind of have that be really embedded or interconnected into um, the way we pre prepare future physicians, right? future osteopathic physicians, um, hoping um, that they will too have a knowledge and appreciation, right, for not just content that we um, give them related to osteopathic medicine, but really have um, a drive to understand um, their patients in whatever communities that they may find themselves. So that was exciting for me. Um, and I've been here, and it has been uh, just the time of my life since I've been here. So and talk more about your role, day-to-day -day operations in the college, how you go about, again, performing your life's work. So my role actually touches everything in the yeah. college, right? So from human resources, um, thinking about curriculum, um, <laughs> how we make decisions um, for the college and creating the college in the way that we want to see ourselves in the future, right? Creating um, an osteopathic college of medicine um, that will prepare the, the next cadre, right? Uh, physicians, uh, physician scientists. And so uh, when I talked about the fact that every day I get to think about these questions um, and really, uh, really do the work to provide um, Infrastructure, yes, but sometimes even just to hold space so people can have the conversations, all right, around, so what would it look like for me to practice from an equity lens? What would it look like for me to really think about um, the possibilities um, for curricula, right? And so that um, not just the students who are seated before me today, but those who are coming are able to see themselves, are able to envision themselves practicing from a lens of, um, of cultural intelligence and humility, right? Um, 
And then how do we really go about changing medicine uh, so that, you know, we can uh, work to counter some of the historical legacies of distrust and mistrust, um, but also so that um, we really are talked about tearing down those barriers, right? Um, we really are able to take our... Um, our profession to the next level, right? So these are things that we may have inherited, but now it's time for us to do the work um, to fashion a legacy that we leave for others. Yes. Talking with Dr. Marita Gilbert on MSU today, this episode, she's the Associate Dean of Diversity and Campus Inclusion for MSU's College of Osteopathic Medicine. And let's get back to the, mm-hmm. the Dr. Anderson lecture series uh, tell us a little bit about the history of the series. It's been 24 years and a little bit about Dr. Anderson, how it got started and how, why it's so, in, you know, enduring. So William G. Anderson is just a figure beloved um, in our profession, in our college, but certainly in terms of the civil rights um, legacy and history. So I'll tell you about who he has been and his contributions to our profession. Um, So I believe he's 95 years old. (laughs) Give or take. (laughs) I told him the other day, that's the number I'm going with because that's the last (laughs) one that you told me. Um, And in that time, you know, he's really been a trailblazer within the profession, right? So he was um, the first black person to be president of the American Osteopathic Association. And often when I go to some of the AOA meetings or our Michigan Osteopathic Association meetings, um, I hear from folks either in the hallway or um, when we go to the receptions and hear about some of the ways that he really tried to have a dialogue with the profession about being more inclusive and ways to do that, right? Not just, you know, with finger pointing, but really thinking about, you know, what are some of those barriers? If they're economic, then we need to create scholarships, right? Um, If it's about who's here and who becomes faculty, then we need to think about endowed chairs, right? So um, he's had that kind of impact on our profession, but he also was a close friend of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And so... um, There are photographs of uh, Dr. King coming to Dr. Anderson's house in Detroit um, and having osteopathic manipulative medicine. Um, (laughs) (laughs) uh, And so in Albany, Georgia, Dr. Anderson um, really was a comrade and confidant for Dr. King and was instrumental in the Albany um, movement. And so... Um, before my time, before I came back to the College of Osteopathic Medicine, um, we decided to name the series for him, right? Just because of all of his contributions to the profession, but also to American history. And we felt like we wanted to capture that. So he, it was his idea to start the series and then the college embraced it so much and named it after him. And I love, I love when people say, well, in the beginning, I remember, you know, it was, um, much smaller, but we're so proud to see how it's grown, Right. And to me, that kind of is a, a testament, number one, for the longevity, number two, for support, right, um, through the college and through the university. And also that this idea about really talking about freedom movements remains important and significant. And talk about the meaningfulness of that subtitle, Slavery to Freedom, that's in the lecture series. So um, I think it was really important early on um when, when kind of at the, the, slavery, the slavery to Freedom series inception, to talk about not just black people as um, having been enslaved, but really what the experience, the culture, the history, the resistance, um, the purposeful strategy around moving us as a people from this period of enslavement by the way, parenthetically, not all of us came to this country um, enslaved, right? But really kind of capturing that history and talking about um, what that movement has, that movement through time has looked like, but also what, what the threads, the themes, the ideas, 
were and are that kind of encapsulate our our um, constant and persistent struggle to always move towards freedom for us as a people. Um, so we do it, of course, during Black History Month, or I talk about it as um, our celebration of Black histories and futures, right? So we do that throughout the month of February, but it was always this um, intention to be thoughtful about not just the people, right? Not just the people who were advocating, not just the people who were leading, not the just the people at the grassroots, but the ideas, right? Because those are transcendent once um, our elders pass away as new babies are born, right? These are the things that remain. And these are the things that we are left with. Um, And some of them come with big questions that we're still grappling with. And some um, come with kind of an evolution of thought or tactic. And so that's really, I think, part of what the series tries to capture. Because when you invite people, you do you give them a lot of freedom to for on the topic? Or do you say, we'd like you to hit on these couple of things or just and give us your idea on what slavery to freedom means? I'm just yeah. curious what you say to the people so, you invite. In all honesty, I don't give them parameters at all. Yeah, that would be my guess. I yeah. mostly um, allow them to kind of just see... Um, The speakers who have been um, a part of the series before, which I found people really, really appreciate. Um, And I really talk to each of the presenters about showing up as their authentic selves and really talking to us um, from their own experience, their own perspective, um, and their own platforms. And so um, we've really had... Um, some really rich conversation. And what I love is um, so far I haven't really decided, okay, um, for this particular year, we're going to have just one theme. And so each year the presenters have been really diverse, right? And, And part of that in my mind has been intentional so that our audience also sees that freedom movements don't all look the same perhaps may not even all function in the same ways. Um, And most importantly to me, I hope it's always a message that there is yet room for you, right? And so um, perhaps you're not a legal scholar, but you do know something about education and how education has been important to us as a people Um, and what the, the... future landscape, right, in terms of education as a freedom movement is. Maybe you know nothing about philanthropy, right? But you do have an idea about how to do um, community organizing, right? And so um, there are always different presenters invited to come and then press and probe us to think about kind of um, where we fit, but also kind of what are those next steps, what are the freedom movements that maybe we aren't talking about, right, that we haven't yet tackled? Or what are the freedom movements of the future that we should be thinking about, that we should be planning for, that we should be strategizing about? Um, I think importantly, and one of the things that I hope comes through um, from the series is that there's usually an arc, right? So... Um, Almost inevitably, there's nothing that is entirely brand new. Um, There's something that usually pulls on a thread from um, some other speaker we've had, um, whether that year or in another year. So there is an African, West African principle of Sankofa, this idea that we reach back and get it, right? That while we are yet working on moving forward, right, that there are some things that we still want to reach back. We want to honor that, right? We want to carry some of those things with us as we're yet creating for the future. That's part of, I think, what you were telling me before we recorded. As you evolve the series, Mm -hmm. the word multi-generational kept coming up. You want to make sure this connects with everyone, right? Absolutely. Um, So uh, I think I shared this, my own experience with you. Um, I was a professor. I was teaching. And this was my senior class in Black Feminisms. And at the time, um, Hillary Clinton was running for president. And, you know, I had already, you know, constructed the syllabus, 
But I always talk to my students about the fact that in our class, our syllabus was organic. And so there were some things, you know, maybe we'd spend a little more time in one place, less than another. And as we were preparing for the next week, um, we were getting ready to do a unit on Shirley Chisholm. And not only had my students never heard of her, right, but um, at that particular time, I, there was either a debate coming on that evening. They had no idea that Hillary Clinton was not the first woman to run for president. And so um, that was quite a moment for me. Um, and since then, I've, I've really tried to work to make sure that we're always having intergenerational dialogue about these things that we're seeing um, in our current moment, um, things that we think of as historical, right, or um, uh, this idea of firsts, um, but always really, really wanting young people to be able to have that experience that I did, which was to be able to see myself in history, to know, um, to know these narratives, even if widely um, they aren't taken up or um, really confront this idea of erasure, right? And so those names um, are so comfortable in our young people's mouths that they speak them with familiarity, that they breathe them in, um, in a way that is like sweet air in their lungs. That's been really important to me. I think on the series, I also want um, young people who live in this area, right, to be able to have access to these histories and narratives which are so rich and robust, right? And so I think as we were talking before, um, I would love it if there is some, some student who's not even yet uh, old enough to attend some elementary school student or junior high student who is sitting in the audience and um, gets to learn about some person who they've never heard of before but it so deeply resonates with them that they feel like okay I've got it and this is this is how I want to move on that for the rest of my life mm -hmm. so that's important um, and I hope that's the work that the series does yeah and just give us a a sense of who you have on the, the docket for 2024 here, the 24th year. So my goodness, uh, we kicked off last Thursday on February 1st with Dr. Tanisha Ford, um, who is just amazing. So um, her scholarship really is about black women's contributions to freedom movements. Yes, here in the U.S., but she really talks about more broadly about a global impact. She also talks about things like um, philanthropy and its role um, in supporting the work of um, uh, freedom dreaming. I'll start by saying that, but freedom work, right? That there is a cost, right? Everything costs something. So if we are, um, one of the examples that she gave last week was, you know, the Montgomery boy bus boycott. Well, people still had to get to work. Right. And so someone had to pay the folks who were using their personal vehicles to transport people to and from. How do we raise that money? Right. Um, and her work really talks more. Um, it talks at a micro and macro level. So we get to see contributions large and small, but even in terms of building a financial infrastructure so that nationally the work can happen. Right. Whether it's in. Uh, Montgomery, Alabama, or in Harlem, New York. So um, we had just an amazing conversation with her. And I think one of the things that I've heard from audiences, um, Dr. Tanisha Ford has written her fourth book about Molly Moon, who was just a powerhouse fundraiser, but also visionary, right? So for her, it was important to not just raise money, but to think about um, how we actually um, can fund freedom movements nationally, right? Um, and, and sometimes it might look differently geographically, right? Like sometimes the, um, the 
greatest concern in one place may not necessarily be the same in another part of the country, but they are both worthy causes, both happening um, at the si- at the same time and urgent. Uh, one of the things Dr. Ford reminded us about <laughs> is that even within um, freedom movements, right? These, these um, efforts of advocacy and activism towards liberation, right? There are still things like gender dynamics that come into play, right? There are still things like class um, ideology, that are undertones for kind of what we're seeing. Um, and I and I think one of the important contributions Dr. Ford left us with is so she gives us, again, this woman, Molly Moon, who is just absolutely phenomenal. And I believe all of us should know her name and know her contributions, but doesn't end the conversation with her as a singular figure. She really pushed us to think about um, what's happening now, right? So um, when she pressed us to think about um, Black giving or philanthropy more broadly as a freedom movement, it really was a conversation about um, the institution of philanthropy as it functions now. Who's giving and to what? Um, Who is empowered or who sits in spaces of power? right, within those dynamics, who should have power, right? And how do we have conversations that ultimately are always about getting us free? So that was Dr. Tanisha Ford. Uh, This week on February 8th, we will have MC Light. Uh, This is our nation's uh, celebration of 50 years of hip hop. Now, (laughs) I grew up at a particular time now, so... This is a very important moment for me um, in Black history. And um, I have heard Queen Latifah talk about MC Light as the godmother of hip hop. Um, She is the first Black woman to um, go gold, right? To have a record go gold, important. Um, But I think she's also kind of given us this um, model for evolution, right? So um, she is also now an announcer. I can't wait to ask her about the Grammys uh, last Sunday because she is the voice of the Grammys. Um, and then now, you know, I, I've used this word while we've been sitting here a lot, this idea of legacy. And so now she is working to develop an artist, a five-year-old rapper, um, which is, I just love, like, I I, I love this idea of um, that we're creating and holding space for the next generation. And then she also is involved in philanthropic work around um, Black women. And so I'm super excited to talk to her a little, I'll say anxious, not nervous, just because um, I still remember, like, as I'm speaking to you, I remember having posters of her on my wall when I was growing up. That, that was back, you know, old folks. That's what we used to do is we had like posters <laughs> that we got out of the magazines and we had them on our walls. But um, the reason why I had her always <clears throat> in close proximity to myself was she was always this model of womanhood, black womanhood that was powerful and very self-possessed Um um, that functioned outside of, um, anyone else's gaze, right? Like she was really about, I'm writing for me and not necessarily dictated by, um, marketing strategies, right? Like what should be hot or who else to attract. And I think, um, for young girls, uh, like me, It was kind of this reminder of like, oh, I can do anything. I can really do anything. Like I, not only can I do anything, but I deserve to take up space in the way that I choose to, right? So um, I'm excited for her to be here and to talk to us about that. Because if we think about 50 years of hip hop, it seems like a long time, not really, but there's been such a um, expansion 
and evolution and kind of reimagination um, just of that genre. And it has absolutely affected um, both history and culture globally. So I'm, I'm excited to see what she's going to talk to us about. On February 15th, we will have Reverend Dr. William Barber II, um, who, again, is such a giant figure in our um, our history and culture. So let me start by saying he now leads the Poor People's Campaign, which really was um, a last project of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. before he was killed. And I remember um, when Reverend Dr. Barber started Moral Mondays in North Carolina, I remember watching him and thinking, wow, this is so important that he is forcing us as a nation to really have a conversation about poverty and not um, limiting people's ideas about poverty to a specific group. Like he always was very clear that poverty um, (laughs) is in every corner of America, urban or rural, um, regardless of race or ethnicity. And I, I was always impressed that a scholar of his stature really didn't just sit on like accolades and, you know, this is who I am. But he was out in the street getting arrested on Mondays at the Capitol because he um, was really challenging us as a nation to think about and talk about poverty. And not just, I mean, yes, I remember talking to my family at our kitchen table about that work. But those most poised to make policy decisions in this nation, right? And he was taking it to them, right? To their turf. And so um, that has been really important. I think um, it's been, again, one of these uh, threads, a a direct lineage to Dr. King. But in this way, that I love, which is to say, I'm ready to have this conversation if you're not. I'm ready to have it if it's dangerous. And I'm ready to have it even if you don't like it. Um, And so really having conversation, but also intentional and purposeful um, action around how we address poverty that is liberation for many in this nation. And so I, I thought it was important to include that as a, um, a speaker, a presenter, and also a conversation uh, about freedom movements this year. We are for the first time <laughs> in <laughs> Slave Reader Freedom history having a concert, um, which is wild, but I love it. Um, and it is completely student constructed and run um, by three students. Um, Two uh, are from the College of Music, right? So Phoenix Miranda and um, Caleb Robinson. And then uh, the third is Rasan Watson, who um, is a part of our gospel choir. And so just kind of um, seeing their excitement to Uh, record music that really um, talks about, you know, they, when they first asked me, or we we sat down to have a conversation about this, um, we talked about love really being um, at the center of freedom movements, right? That you have to really love something to challenge it or to say, this will not do. And so um, when we think about, I'm going to use the word black music, right? Because I'm talking diasporically. Um, It has always been an engine for us. Whether it was, in some ways, so I I mentioned Bernice Johnson Reagan and 
um, the sound of her voice and how it really signaled we're marching, right? Her voice was the command that was to start or um, often there were songs that had been translated from um, spirituals, Negro spirituals um, to comfort in, in dark moments. Um, I remember learning about the Birmingham children who decided, you know, they were the ones that could actually go to jail and they left school um, and all of them walked out of their classrooms, met up and then walked into jails. And I'm always moved by um, that story because it was dangerous, but they felt it was too dangerous for their parents. And um, I did my undergraduate degree at Auburn University in Alabama. And um, when I talked to um, some of the elders at that time, and of course they're terrified because their children are in these jails. And I remember one of them saying it was the sound of the children singing. that gave them strength. And so, um, it's really something <laughs> to sing music, to um, write lyrics uh, that are meant to be soothing and believing that that comfort may never come for you, but you're dreaming that world for um, those who may follow you um, and you are are creating a vision of hope for them even if you don't see it and so um, as you know I met with these students who were like yeah let's do a concert this year how could I say no I had no idea how I was going to do it <laughs> but I'm really excited <laughs> that that will be on Wednesday, um, February 21st. Um, I also candidly always love to celebrate our students. Um, they really um, have always been the drivers of, so of social movements, but socially, um, of social movements, but also freedom movements. So I'm excited for them. And they titled it, Love Got Me Over. Um, and they felt like even songs of resistance were really rooted in love. So um, I'm excited for that and thankful to the College of Music for um, being a co-sponsor. And then um, Dr. Ronnie Whitfield will be with us on February 23rd. Um, I get to work with amazing people every day. And Dr. Krista Walker in the College of Music said, you know, we'd love to kind of co-sponsor something with you this year. And so when we talked about um, what that would look like, we decided, okay, having Dr. Whitfield come and actually talk about Black men's health um, would be a great opportunity. And so um, we are inviting everyone, certainly students from our colleges, the College of Osteopathic Nurse, uh, Medicine and Nursing to come join us. But we'd really love for folks in the community to come as well um, to learn about, you know, some of the most pressing issues in Black men's health and really what we should be doing to combat that as a community. Well, and it's the 24th annual Dr. William G. Anderson Slavery to Freedom Lecture Series we've been talking about. With Dr. Marita Gilbert, it's put on by the College of Osteopathic Medicine yes. at MSU. And there's much more, of course, if you just go to osteopathicmedicine.msu.edu. Yes. And Marita, if, if you don't mind, just a couple more questions. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember speaking with, a. you may know Jeff Ray and Julian uh -huh. Shambliss. They were talking with me about five years ago. And I remember one of them saying, black history is American history. Is. And I just wonder... Your thoughts on Black History Month. Do you like that it has a month? Do you, are you bummed that it needs a month? Just your thoughts on how it's celebrated and how you'd like it to be different, if you would. So Carter G. Woodson started Black History Week 
Um, really with this idea that <laughs> similar to what we've been talking about earlier, that um, our kids needed to know um, about our history. And at the time it wasn't happening um, in, you know, school systems. And so it kind of started, grew out of this, let's say curriculum, we'll use that word um, very loosely, um, intended to teach, yes, black children about our history. But it, you know, I mean, it, it was important because America was also learning, right? That we were more than just people who had been enslaved. Um, and if I remember even to my own childhood, right, um, the conversation about the fact that we have intellectual contributions, right, engineers and um, biologists and, um, yes, folks who have been involved in the arts, scientists, um, people who have shifted public policy in this nation, right? Um, and that was important then, It is important now. So I I start with Black History Week because um, the fact that we are now at an iteration where it is 28 days long um, is progress. Um, But I'll say this is also not enough. So Black history is American history. If you watched the Grammys last Sunday, um, Black music is American music. Everything that we saw is derived from black music, right? And so um, really knowing the breadth and depth, the richness, which includes some struggle. And I say that not limiting that to um, African descended peoples, right? But I think it is an opportunity for us as a nation. And so um, you and I talked a little bit about this um trend this these attacks on quote DEI nationally in some ways I say what a convenient distraction right Um, but if I think more um, deeply about my own sentiments about that I would say this I think as Americans, we are built of sterner stuff than that. I think there are um, some really difficult moments in American history. And there are some folks who are accountable, (laughs) right? There, you know, and we can name some of them, right? Like that's, that is a fact. I also think that we can handle that. One of the things, the joys of working with young people is that um, you get to see that young people are really great at handling difficult, challenging, you know, um, complicated things, um, working through them. And then on the other side, figuring out like, okay, well, I don't want that. (laughs) Like, I I certainly don't want to continue with that or I don't, I reject that. And instead I choose, I want to build this. And so um, it is, you know, as parents, (laughs) there are, we get to make some decisions. But I do think knowing about Um, the vast and vibrant, sometimes complicated and difficult history of this nation makes us all better, all better. Um, And shame serves no one well. So, um, you know, I'm really, I really am a champion of trusting, number one, the process, and also trusting that particularly if we talk about young people, that they are equipped to be able to handle difficult things. Um, And they've always, young people have always, any nation, right? They've always pushed us 
to be better versions of ourselves, right? Because um, there's something about that youth that you're still daring, you're still imaginative, right? Um, And so to that, I would just say enough, right? Um, I understand that some people hold a sense of hurt, right? About being confronted with some realities that perhaps um, they did not know. But again, I think we're built of sterner stuff, right? And so really the work is not to to stay in a place of shame, but really figure out, okay, now what's next for us? What's, What's next for me in my community right here, right? How do I mobilize to get us to the better? What's 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 next for us as a state, right? And how do I really um, connect with folks for us to be better? What's next for us as a nation, right? Certainly at a pivotal moment when we're really having to make some decisions. Um, and I think knowing and appreciating the the vastness, the breadth, depth, and scope of our our story is important. And one last thing, Marit, and I know we could have a conference on this, but (laughs) college students in general, particularly from the College of Osteopathic Medicine, as they go out into the world, what what are you optimistic about? What are you, you know, worried about for them? I guess just your thoughts on the students and what faces them out there. If you were to look at social media or sometimes at our dinner tables, um, (laughs) young people are problematized in these very particular ways. I, um, I always will bet on young people. I mean, okay. Perfect example, right? Um, My mom can't figure out certain things with her remote and her television. (laughs) My nephews, it's taken care of. They don't even need the manual for anything. Yeah. Um, And so I think the real challenge, though, is us and um, certainly the model that (laughs) we are living before them, right? Whether that's about civility or an embrace of um, progress, um or a vision for an inclusive future. Like that's, that's us. They're, they're now seeing us. I would say though, um, for the most part, I think that these younger generations are more ready. Like, let's think about this. These are students who have grown up in a world that is the most diverse that it's ever been. The most access to information that we've ever had. For good and bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> but also what I find is, again, now I work with, um, at one point I work with undergraduate students. I now work with professional students. I find that students have far greater expectations of us than we give them credit for. There are things that they want to see in their curriculum. There are things that they want to see in terms of the kinds of co-curricular experiences that we're um, providing, there are things that they want to see in terms of the hiring, right? Like when they walk into our colleges or our buildings, for the most part, (laughs) they're going to ask us, this is it, right? Or, or what's your plan, right? Or, Uh, When we ask them in interview questions, they say to us they want to be in a place that really um, looks like or is representative of the community of, you know, communities in America. So they are by far ahead of us. I think the challenge for us is to sometimes speak less, listen more um, and then create the tools that will allow them to grow into their their potential and their possibility. That's right. We have two ears and one mouth. So listen <laughs> twice as much as you talk, right? Is it, so I may never a, be invited good, back now. No. <laughs> well, Dr. Gilbert, it's just been a pleasure talking with you about all these things, primarily the lecture series. Anything important you want to add or I haven't asked you or some final thoughts? I think when we celebrate Black histories and Black futures, we celebrate American histories and futures. And I think if we make way for the most vulnerable 
in any of our communities to thrive, not just, you know, exist marginally, but thrive and for folks to be their full, whole, authentic selves and to be able to love what they see. I think that is when we become the best of who we are. Dr. Gilbert, thanks again for joining me today. Thank you. That's Dr. Marita Gilbert, the Associate Dean of Diversity and Campus Inclusion in Michigan State University's College of Osteopathic Medicine. And again, please, I encourage you to check out the 24th Annual Dr. William G. Anderson Slavery to Freedom Lecture Series. And there's much more at osteopathicmedicine.msu.edu. And I'm Russ White. This is MSU Today.